Darwin Day. And we have a wonderful speaker to do that. Please take out your, your cell phones and silence them. We are recording this and live streaming it to our Richfield campus. Uh, next week, we will hear from Noteworthy, which is the BYU female um, a cappella group. So that'll be fun. Bring your friends. Before we start with our, uh, before we have our speaker, we are going to start with a couple of musical selections by students here from the theater group from the, the play, the musical, that's starting next week into the woods. So I'm going to turn the time over to them. Hi guys, so I'm the music director for Into the Woods and that opens next week and it plays the next two weekends. Uh, if, you haven't, no, you're good. if you haven't heard of Into the Woods before, basically a summary is it's basically a cacophony of a bunch of different fairy tales that you know, like Little Red Riding Hood, Jack and the Beanstalk, Cinderella, and they all kind of go together, okay? For the first half of the show, it all seems to go pretty well, but then the second half of the show, they kind of start to explore uh, some of the consequences and it doesn't maybe uh, end how you think, okay? Uh, we have a few numbers. Um, Little Red is going to sing about how she just uh, went through the wolf's stomach, and then Jack will sing about going to the beanstalk. <laughs> Mother said straight ahead, not too late or be misled. I should have heeded her advice, but he seemed so nice and he showed me things many beautiful things that I hadn't thought to explore they were off my path so I never had cared I had been so careful I never had cared and he made me feel excited well excited and scared when he said come in with that sickening grin how could I know what was in store once his teeth were bared though i really got scared well excited and scared but he drew me close and he swallowed me down down a dark slimy path where like secrets that i never want to know and when everything familiar seemed to disappear forever at the end of the path was granny once again so we wait in the dark until someone sets us free and we're brought into the light and we're back at the start and I know things now, many valuable things that I hadn't known before. Do not put your faith in a cape and a hood. They will not protect you the way that they should. And take extra care with strangers. Even flowers have their dangers. And though scary is exciting, nice is different than good. And now I know, don't be scared. Granny is right, just be prepared. Isn't it nice to know a lot? And a little bit not. There are giants in the sky. There are big, tall, terrible giants in the sky. When you're way up high and you look below at the world you left and the things you know, little more than a glance is enough to show you how small you are. When you're way up high and you're on your own in a world like none that you've ever known, your heart is lead and your earth is stone, you're free to do whatever pleases you, exploring things you never dared because you don't care when suddenly there's a big, tall, terrible giant at the door. A big, tall, terrible lady giant sweeping the floor And she gives you food and she gives you rest And she draws you close to her giant breast And you know things now that you never knew before Not till the sky only just when you made a friend and all And you know she's big but you don't feel small Someone bigger than her comes along the hall To swallow you for lunch And your heart is lead and your stomach's stone And you're really scared being all alone 
And it's then that you long for the things you've known And the world you left and little you own The fun is done You steal what you can and run And you scramble down and you look below And the world below begins to grow The roof, the house, and your mother at the door The roof, the house, and the world you never thought to explore And you think of all of the things you've seen And you wish that you could live in between And you're back again, only different than before After the sky There are giants in the sky There are big, tall, terrible, awesome, scary, wonderful giants in the sky wow. Okay, so those of you taking the class, Into the Woods would be a great theater uh, performance to go to for one of your cultural events. Okay, moving right on. Jerry Johnson is our speaker today for Darwin Day. Jerry grew up around here, went to North San Pete, so he's a local boy. So we're welcoming him back to Snow College. He's also an evolutionary biologist at Brigham Young University where he's taught for 14 years. Um, he fo his research focuses on the evolution of behavior how new species form, and using genetic approaches to reconstruct the evolutionary history of species across global landscapes. Most of his work is constructed in, um, on fishes in Costa Rica. In fact, a few weeks ago I was emailing him and he, he was in Costa Rica. He teaches classes in evolution, ecology, and genetics, and beginning next year he'll offer a course in evolutionary medicine. His academic training has taken him all over the world, including a BA from University of Utah, a PhD from the University of Vermont, a postdoctoral training with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Seattle, in Seattle, and a sabbatical training at the University of Padova in Italy. But it all started for him right here at Snow College many years ago when he got his associate's degree. So please help me welcome back to Snow, Jerry Johnson. Yeah. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Thank you so much, Celia. I appreciate coming back here. I have to make one clarification, though. It wasn't North Sampi, it was North Severe, right? So if any, anybody, I heard some guys made a Denny's run not long ago down to Salina. So um, I'm delighted to be here. I love Snow College. Absolutely a pleasure for me to come back and talk to you today. Um, it's interesting to think about growing up in Salina and uh, studying evolution and how that uh, regression happened for me to get to a point where this has become what I do in the world. I want to talk today about two things. First of all, I want to introduce you to Charles Darwin. I want to talk a little bit about why Darwin's made such a big impact, not just on the field of biology, but upon the way we think about so many things in the world. And then after that, I want to emphasize why I think you should all pay attention to evolution because it might just save your life. So Darwin, when we think about him, we often look at him this way, as this old guy in a cloak, right, that looks a little bit creepy, somebody you wouldn't want to run into if you were out on the street alone. But I want you to imagine Charles Darwin as a young student, just like many of you. So Darwin, right, was this guy in my mind, where all of the good stuff happened. Charles Darwin grew up in a pretty wealthy circumstance. His grandfather and his father were both medical doctors. His mother actually came from a very wealthy family. They made pottery in China, the Wedgwood family. So this was Darwin's home. Uh, you can see that's a pretty good gig for the early 1800s. And uh, here's Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus. Look at him. Right? Looks like a guy that's been around the block. He's kind of got that look like, we're, we've got our place worked out in society here. Uh, Erasmus was a naturalist. He's a medical doctor, but he loved the natural world. 
and uh, wrote, uh, wrote several books, right? So he was thinking a lot about the diversity of life. Loved plants, right? And so Darwin sort of had some influence from his grandfather. His dad was a more stern character than his grandfather. So Robert Darwin uh, had expectations for his children, right? Maybe as you've come off to college and you said goodbye to mom and dad, there was some advice about how life should go forward. But uh, Charles grew up with a really high expectation that he'd become a doctor just like his grandfather and his father, okay? So when Darwin came of age, he in fact, um, oh, a little bit about uh, Charles' own uh, sort of perception of himself. So when he was young, he was sent off to school. And uh, this comes from his autobiography. This is what he said about himself as a student. Maybe some of you can relate, right? He says, uh, I went to this school in Shrewsbury and I was told that I was much slower in learning than my younger sister, right? So of the, of the siblings, he was like the one that wasn't quite keeping up, okay? Um, but Darwin was a curious uh, individual by nature. And when he was about your age, he was sent to Edinburgh University. And here he was going to begin his training to become a medical doctor. Now, it turns out that Darwin, when he started to get into the classes, didn't actually love them that much. Darwin said this, he says, the instruction at Edinburgh was uh, by, by all by lectures. We didn't go do anything. People just talked to us the whole time. And uh, he, he said these were intolerably dull. Darwin wanted to be outside, right? In fact, what he says about his anatomy experience was, he says, Dr. So-and-so made his lectures on human anatomy as dull as he was himself, and the subject disgusted me. Now, I can tell you at Snow College that is not the case, right? Because I know Professor Gardner, and I've been in those lectures, completely opposite of Darwin's experiences. I sort of uh, find it humorous that Darwin calls anatomy out, because if you look at Darwin and what it was like to be involved in anatomy, he would actually have op had opportunities to attend surgery in the surgical theater, back before there was anesthesia, right? So Darwin would go in, and if somebody came in and had a problem with their leg, right, the doctor would say, do you want it amputated? And if he said yes, he'd ask him one more time, do you want it amputated? And if he said yes, right, within 20 seconds, a saw came out, and the leg was off, right? Screaming, blood, tourniquet, all of that stuff. And it turns out Darwin did not like it. It was not his thing. Right? He's like, oh yeah, I'm not going to become a medical doctor. And he decided right then and there, like, not happening. Okay? So imagine this. He like tells dad, not going to do it, dad. Don't want to go down that road. And his dad, right, was not happy. But he said, okay, I get it. Here's plan B. You're going to go to Cambridge and you're going to become a minister. Okay? Any, any nobleman, right, that, that didn't go into the profession that they were supposed to go into, you could always fall back and become a preacher. So Darwin goes to Cambridge, and he sort of has the same experience at Cambridge that, that um, he did at his first institution. He just didn't love it that much, right? And, uh, and so Darwin's sort of struggling as a student, thinking, what am I going to become? It turns out, though, although Darwin didn't love Cambridge, he did find a passion. And what Darwin fell in love with was sort of what he was inclined to do in the first place, right? He fell in love with the things that were outside. And his first passion was beetles, okay? Absolutely loved collecting beetles, right? So you sit around and think, how can I make a job out of that, right? Beetle lover. Um, Darwin, there's fun stories about Darwin. This is actually Darwin's beetle collection, still found at Cambridge. You can go check it out, right? See the beetles that Darwin collected. Fun story, right? Darwin out collecting, and he saw one beetle that was new to him, grabbed it with one hand, and there was another beetle that he saw that he hadn't had in his collection, and he grabbed that one. And then there was a third beetle, right? He's like, whoa, I gotta have this other beetle. So he took the one in this hand, popped it in his mouth. So he could grab that one, thought, Hmm, I got this, right? And then the beetle in his mouth, right, let out this acrid secretion that poisoned his, like spit it out, lost both beetles. But that was the kind of student that Darwin was, right? Hands-on kind of guy. Well, here's what dad said to Darwin. You are 
washed out, man. This is not good, right? In fact, he said to him, Darwin, you care for nothing but shooting, right? Playing with your dogs and rat catching, and you are a disgrace to yourself and to your family. Ouch, right? Lots of pressure from home. And so Darwin's at this point like, what am I going to do with myself? And then this opportunity comes to the rescue. And here's Darwin's great opportunity. He's invited by a mutual acquaintance to go on a boat ride, but not just any boat ride. He's going to go out on a boat commissioned by the Royal Navy of England to go out and survey the world. It's going to go all the way around the globe, right? And Darwin gets to go. His job, not the physician, not even the naturalist. His job was to be a buddy to this guy. Right here, Robert Fitzroy, the captain, had been on a voyage and got very lonely. Didn't interact with the crew because he was the captain. So he just wanted someone to come with him to be his buddy, right? That was it. So Darwin's official title, right? Gentleman companion to Captain Robert Fitzroy. That's his job, right? And there's a great book of this, about this called The Voyage of the Beagle. You should all read it. So Darwin takes off on this awesome voyage, um, and it does. It takes him from England, down through South America, around the Cape, to the Galapagos Islands, uh, through Australia, all the way back to England. It was supposed to take two years. It took five years. And he saw all sorts of things on this voyage. The things that impressed Dar Darwin the most, lots of, of specimens collected in different places, but we often talk about the Galapagos Islands and the impact it had on Charles Darwin. The thing about the Galapagos is that they're unlike anywhere else in the world. There are organisms there that are so tame that you can walk right up to them. In fact, I had a chance to go to the Galapagos Islands when I was an undergraduate student. Long story about how I pulled that one off. But I had one of those little water point and click cameras, the kind of lame ones, right, that you like point, and then it goes, zzz, zzz, zzz. It used to be film in it. You know what that is, Dr. Gardner? Film, okay? <laughs> film in it, right? And I got these awesome pictures, like, of Galapagos hawks, and people are like, wow, you got awesome pictures, right, of, like, a hawk. And I'm like, yeah, because it wouldn't fly. It was just, like, right there, right? So very interesting organisms, and Darwin sees things like these iguanas, some of them on the land, some in the water that actually forage underwater. He collected almost everything where he went. He collected birds from the Galapagos Islands. And so when Darwin finishes his voyage, he comes back, right? And he starts thinking about all of this diversity of life that he's experienced. And Darwin thought, you know, I wonder if there's something that could explain all of the biodiversity in the world. If there's some idea that could account for all of this. Because prior to Darwin, people were taught that the diversity of life simply came about by a sort of um, miraculous creation, right? Like everything was sort of made um, instantaneously. And Darwin wondered if there might be a more natural explanation that could account for this, okay? So he looked at things like all of these beetles and thought, how did they get like that, right? What would the process be that could account for this? Darwin has all sorts of specimens with him that he's brought back. And in fact, when he returns to England, the, the scientists just swarmed him, right? They're like, Darwin, you're awesome, man. Look at all the great stuff that you've collected. And Darwin became sort of a famous guy just because he's been on this great voyage and brought all this cool stuff back, okay? Darwin begins to think about whether or not there might be a mechanism that could account for all of the diversity that exists on the earth. This is on Darwin's mind, but there's one other thing on Darwin's mind, right? Which is the same sort of thing that's on some of your minds, right? He's like, I'm looking for love. I'm at a point in my life now where I need to settle down. Or he wondered if he was. This tells you a little bit about Darwin's uh, personality. Darwin made a pro and con list, right? I know, some of you have done this already, okay? Pros and cons. And he was kind of looking at this lady, okay? Now, don't... Don't be too grossed out here, but this was his first cousin, right? But he liked her, right? No, it wasn't a problem back then. Keep all the money in the family, right? That kind of deal. So, so Darwin's like, here's his pro and con list. Here's the pros. It'd be nice to have a companion. She could keep me warm. He wrote that down in his little notebook. 
could keep me warm. Cons, I'll have to talk to her a lot. Um, In-laws, right? And we'll probably argue. Those are the cons. And then he writes at the bottom of his list, but it would be better companionship than a dog. That's what Darwin wrote. Right? science -y sort of guy. Well, he marries Emma, right? He marries her, and, um, and in fact, in many ways, they're extremely compatible with one another. Very important in Darwin's thinking and his development. Darwin eventually um, was father to nine children, but Darwin experienced a tragedy, a really influential event in his life. His daughter, Annie, at uh, age uh, 10, contracted an illness and had a really prolonged bout with this illness and eventually died. And it shook Darwin. He admits that this was his favorite child, right? And it shook Darwin. And uh, it made him question lots of things about faith, uh, about the importance of what he was doing, right? Went into sort of a deep melancholy uh, over this experience. And if we read in Darwin's journals, right, it was a very pivotal uh, time for him. So how does he get himself out of it? He goes to work, right? He got to work on the science stuff that, that interested him. And his friends tried to lift him up and say, Darwin, you've discovered so many interesting things. You need to start writing some books. You need to let everybody know what you found. And uh, interestingly, his friends said, barnacles. You should write a book about barnacles. What? Right? But that was it. Write the barnacle book. That'll be exciting, okay? So he does. He starts launching into this, this treatise on barnacles. And it's about this time that he starts to come up with these fundamental ideas about how the diversity of life came about. This is what he came up with. Can you see that? It's a little drawing in a little notebook that Darwin had. And it depicts an evolutionary tree. He concludes that the diversity of life came about through this process of evolution by natural selection. And to Darwin, it makes complete sense that, uh, that this pattern uh, could explain all living things. But if you ask Darwin what he privately thinks about this, he says when he came to this realization, to him it felt like he was confessing a murder. He was so worried that it would shake the faith of those people that were close to him and that it would undermine faith that he just didn't want to bring it up. Now Darwin himself was never an atheist or, or viewed himself as somebody trying to undermine religion, but he recognized that for some, having a natural explanation for the diversity of life could create challenges to faith, right? And so he decided, I'm never going to talk about this. I'm never going to publish it. I'll never put it out there at all, okay, until this happened, right? This young buck named Alfred Russell Wallace was in, uh, was in Malaysia collecting organisms and came up with the exact same idea Darwin did about natural selection. And he wrote a letter to Darwin and said, hey, I got this cool idea about how the diversity of life on earth came about. And Darwin reads it and he's like, oh no, I'm scooped. This guy came up with my idea. 20 years later, he came up with my idea, right? And so what Darwin does is he says, all right, I'm going to have to tell the world that I came up with this idea even though I don't really want to. And so his work was eventually published in a famous book that you all know on the origin of species, where he describes the mechanism of natural selection and how this diversity came about. Okay? It was 29 years, almost at the end of his life. And what's cool about the book is that it does, in fact, come up with a, a mechanism to account for all biological diversity. Here are just some of the organisms that Darwin talks about in that book. Right? Lots of species that are considered in Darwin's work. But what I want to talk to you today about is this. I want to talk about why this theory matters to us. Now, Darwin himself wrote almost nothing about humans in the origin. In fact, you have to go to the very last chapter, and the only thing you'll find in that book about humans is this single statement. Light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. We might gain some insight into humans with this big idea that I have. And then he left it at that. So what light has been thrown on humans? Well, the first thing that I want to just briefly touch on, and, and again, I work at BYU, which is an institution that's sponsored by, by um, the um, LDS Church, right? 
We talk about this a lot, about evolution and religion. And the only point I want to make on this is that for those who might wonder if there's a place where you can find compatibility between accepting science and the theory of evolution and your religious faith, for most religious faiths, there's common ground, right? That there, that there are ways, in fact, that both of these ideas can be embraced. So um, would be happy to talk about in the Q&A or one-on-one um, -on -one if you want to go through any of those ideas. But, uh, you know, fear not, there's plenty of space there to be able to work in, in this evolutionary field. In fact, I was hired at BYU as an evolutionary biologist, right? But this is the key. This is the thing I want to talk about and why evolution might save your life. So it turns out, like all other organisms, humans also have an evolutionary history, right? That we too are descended from common ancestors and we can trace our ancestry deep all the way back to the origin of life. Okay? We sometimes look at it like this, right? As if we sort of came from, um, from these prior forms. But the truth is that all of these forms that we look at descended from common ancestors. So what does it matter? Well, we can uh, look at multiple lines of evidence that show that humans have common origins with other apes. Okay? So this is outside of the uh, human anatomy lab at BYU where all of the students hang out. right? And so we can see Homo sapiens here uh, to your right, right? And then we have hominin fossils. And it, one only needs to look at them to recognize the similarities, right? Same bone structure, right? And go a little bit deeper and you can look at horse and cow or chimpanzee and you can easily find the similarities. So morphologically, the patterns are apparent, okay? Genetically, there's even better data to show our common ancestry with the apes. Now, there are a couple of books that I think are really fun on this topic. One by Richard Dawkins that starts out with humans and it works all the way back to the origin of life, looking at what, our, what I refer to as our deep genealogy. Okay? And then an even more fascinating book for me is a book written by Neil Shubin called Your Inner Fish. So I study fish. I was in Costa Rica two weeks ago collecting fish. Here's the crazy thing. So many traits that we have as humans first evolved in fish, right? I like to tell my students, you're probably 80% fish, right? You look a little different, but most of what makes you you started in fish, okay? Think about it. You know those little gill arches that fish have that hold the bones, that hold the filamentous gills, right? Some of those arches are actually the bones that now make up your inner ear, Right? We could just trace them. They do this in fish, and now for you, they make it so you can hear me speak. Right? Lots of traits that, are, that we think of as fairly human traits have their origins in our vertebrate ancestors. So given this, right, we can think about ourselves a little bit differently. So I'm going to give you two examples that will demonstrate right, that, in fact, you have that you have sort of evolutionary origins deeper than humans. Here's the first one. How many of you have ever had your wisdom teeth out? Okay, look around, look at all those hands up. Now I want you to, to just think about this. How many of you, when you went in to the dentist and it was like wisdom teeth time, the dentist was like, nope, you don't have any wisdom teeth, you're good to go. Anybody get that? Look around, a few of you, okay. How many of you were like, there were four wisdom teeth that had to come out? One, two, three, four. Okay, bunch of hands that went up. How many of you, it was a weird number, like two, or one, or three. Okay, look around, there's some people that only had a few. Okay, were there, was there anybody who had eight wisdom teeth? There were like eight of them that had to come out. Okay, sometimes that happens, right? It's like, one, like eight, are you kidding me? Eight wisdom teeth, I have to pay for eight of them, right? So, what's going on, folks? Some of you have wisdom teeth, some of you don't. Well, it turns out that if we look at chimpanzee and gorilla, which are our closest relatives, those species have eight extra teeth relative to those of you who had no wisdom teeth, okay? Some of you, right, have reached the point where humans are evolving towards, which is to have no wisdom teeth, right? Plenty of room in your mouth for all the teeth that come in. Some of us are still on the way, which keeps our dentists with their boats, right? You can pay for, pay for that. So, so classic example, right, of human evolution happening right now. Here's an even better one. Did you know 
that you have evolved from mammals that have a remarkable ability to smell. Okay. But we have this ability in a way that we sometimes don't even think of. Okay. Here's an interesting study that was done. Bunch of college students, they needed money. You know the deal, right? Okay. Bunch of college students, boys and girls, were paid to participate in a study. This was the study. Okay. Girls, all you have to do is give me a little blood sample so I can look at the genes that are responsible for your immune response, the MHC alleles. So I just want a little bit of blood and then I'm gonna see what sort of MHC um, immune genes you have, okay? And the boys, right, same thing. I want a little bit of blood, I wanna see what your MHC alleles look like, okay? And these, re these researchers had this hypothesis that boys and girls should choose mates that had alleles that were different so that the offspring would have the widest immune response possible. Okay, that's the hypothesis. And then they did this. Guys, I'm going to give you 10 bucks if you give me some blood and I'm going to have you sleep in a t-shirt. Right? Nope. No cologne, no deodorant. Just go sleep in this t-shirt. Put it in a bag for me when you're done. Seal it up. Okay? And then give it back to me. Right? And then, girls, here's what you get your 10 bucks for. I want you to come in and I want you to smell these t-shirts and tell me who you think smells attractive. That was it. That's all they had to do. You know what they found? They found that women did not have a universally favorite smelling shirt, right? They weren't like, ooh, this guy, he's like, everybody likes that guy. Instead, here's what they found. They found that, that they would choose the t-shirt from the individual that had alleles different from their own. They were actually smelling potential mates, compatible mates that would offer their offspring the greatest diversity in their immune response. Do you hear what I'm saying? Okay. If nothing else comes out of this today, you should think about whether or not it is in your best interest to wear deodorant. You sh I mean, if the relationship starts to get serious, get rid of the deodorant, right? So you can smell whether or not that's the person that's meant for you, right? There's actually evolutionary biologists who have become business people who now have a website called Smell Dating, right? Where you can send in your own t-shirt, right? And then, you know, it's like Tinder with the t-shirt, right? It's that kind of thing. Yeah, we're evolved organisms. All right, but who cares, right? Why should you at Snow College care about evolution, except for maybe the t-shirt thing, okay? Well, it turns out that there's an emerging field of, of uh, evolutionary biology and medicine that brings evolutionary principles into the way that we think about human health. So in most medical schools today, they're considering a course in evolutionary medicine. Uh, in fact, evolutionary medicine right? Evolution types of questions now show up on the MCAT exam, right? And I think more and more we're going to find evolutionary thinking coming into the way that we treat human disease. So if you look at the way that medical training occurs right now, much of the care is to treat symptoms. Just think about it, right? What can we do to make the human condition with less suffering, more tolerable, to take pain away, okay? But remarkably little of the work focuses on the underlying causes of the diseases that we're trying to treat. So this field of evolutionary medicine is an effort to think about why we have these maladies that we do. Okay? And I'll show you a few examples that demonstrate that in fact there's some real insights that can come to us. So these are just a few ways that perhaps evolution can help us understand our health a little bit better. So one of them is that instead of focusing on how body systems work, we ask questions about why the way that they work the way that they do, right? Why is it that we have a tube that we eat through that goes into our stomach that crosses the tube that we use to get the air in and out of our lungs? Why are we built that way, right? Why, does it, why, why do I sometimes choke on my food like that? Why is it like that? Why? Why do men have nipples, right? Why do some individuals have nipples that form all the way down their body, right? Why do I have an appendix? What's that thing all about, 
right? So, um, so by shifting into this sort of evolutionary framework, the hope is that we might gain some insights into how we can uh, treat disease better. Uh, infectious disease, pathogens, bacteria, viruses, parasites, all of these are organisms that have co-evolved with us. All right? And so if we want to think about how to treat them, understanding evolution can help us there. But the one I really want to focus on is the mismatch hypothesis to explain human health problems. Here's how the mismatch hypothesis works. How many of you, when I show up a spider like that, you think, ooh. Anybody get the sort of, anybody hate spiders? Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? If, could you imagine me like putting that spider on your face? What would that do? Just the thought of it, right? If you don't like spiders, just the thought of a spider like crawling on your face, just, okay? But why is that? I mean, if you look at the data in terms of how many people in the world, right, perish by spider bites, it's modest today. But in our past, the spiders were a problem. Snakes, a problem, right? Things that could have hurt us were problems. But today, not so much so. But how about this? I mean, if I show you a handgun, most of you aren't like, ooh, right? You don't freak out about seeing that. Or how about this? Ooh, a car, right? And nobody's worried about a car, but it turns out that the risk to your health from handguns and cars is much greater than spiders, yet you have this biological response to spiders. The reason for that is that we have bodies and brains that evolved in a different time than we live now, right? We're not made for this world. We're not made to come into a beautiful auditorium and sit in soft, cushy chairs, right? and wander off and order something down at the malt shop and just have somebody show up with food. That's not what your brain and your body evolved to deal with. So the mismatch between the environment that we live in and the environment that our bodies evolved for can create problems for us. This is the environment that we evolved for, the Neolithic, right? So, this is what life was like when humans first evolved. Small groups of people, right, sleeping on the ground, going out looking for food, having long bouts of hunger because we couldn't find food. Small groups, right, fire present, nomadic lifestyle, um, hunter-gatherer, use of stone tools. This is what our bodies are for, okay? Yet we live in a world that's very different from that. So. There are still some people on the earth that live close to that. We can go look at the Hazda people, right? We can look at the Mbuti people in the Congo, Australian aboriginals. But by and large, most of us don't live like that, right? We live like this. And there are challenges to that. So we went through a period of hunter-gatherer, right? And then about 10,000 years ago, humans domesticated animals. And a couple hundred years ago, the Industrial Revolution changed the way we live. And if you look at life now and compare it to hunter-gatherer societies, it's fundamentally different. And the problem is that evolution has not been able to keep up with the kind of environment that we live in now. We lag behind. There's a mismatch between our environment and the historic environment. In fact, some authors have gone so far as to say that most of you in this auditorium will die from a mismatch disease. A disease that's caused because your body doesn't belong in this world. So, what's the evidence for that? Well, here are some um, human health conditions that have been ascribed to mismatch problems. Look at the list, right? From apnea to anxiety to Alzheimer's to goiter, hypertension, irritable bowel syndrome, right? MS, myopia, flat feet, the list goes on and on. Right? That there's some evidence that all of these things are due to mismatches between the environment we live in and the one that we came from. How do we know if a disease is a mismatch disease? Well, one way is to ask, is it present in this developed world and absent in a more hunter-gatherer type world? What's different? You could probably generate a better list than this one, but these are things that differ between a hunter-gatherer world and this one. Right? 
diet. Holy cow, we can just go get food if we want it. We don't have to go work for it and forage for it. Different kinds of food. Food that was never available before. Okay? Uh, shoes. Right? You guys all wear shoes as if that's not a big deal. Okay? Shoes are not natural. Right? That's not a normal thing in terms of how we evolved. We don't get the same exposure to parasites and pathogens that we used to. We live in a much more clean world. Okay? We're exposed to new chemicals. We sit in soft chairs instead of squatting on the ground. Right? We sleep in soft beds instead of laying flat in small groups. Right? All of these things differ in our world relative to the historic world. So what does it mean? Well, it means something like this, that when we started taking corn and pulling high fructose corn syrup out of corn and introduce that into our diets in the 1970s, we had a new sugar that went into our body much differently than the sugars that we used to eat, right? In fact, we can't crank up enough insulin to sort of keep track of this sugar coming in so quickly. And it can lead to a condition called metabolic syndrome, right? If we're constantly eating that kind of food, which we know is tied to several diseases that can be very harmful to us, right? Diet is different. Interesting thing, why do we crave things that are so bad for us? Why when you walk by the malt shop and you smell those french fries, or you're like, ooh, I gotta have some of that. I mean, why would your brain tell you to eat something that if you constantly eat it, it's gonna be bad for you, right? It's gonna create health problems. Well, it's because back in the past, there wasn't all that fat around, right? Having that stuff available back then would have been a big deal, okay? A mismatch. How about this one? Shoes, right? Yeah, like think about it. Putting something on your foot to protect the bottom, maybe, but the kinds of shoes we wear now, right, fundamentally change the way our foot interacts with the environment and develops. So some people have argued that that can lead to things like weakened muscles between your foot bones, right, which needs to be compensated for by the fascia, the plantar fascia there, which can become irritated. So we get this thing called plantar fasciitis, all right? Or how about this one, right? You could be like, hey, yeah, I heard today in convocation that we shouldn't spend so much time reading. You're gonna try that one on your professors. But it turns out that if you're constantly bringing something up close to your eyes, like this, and not spending time looking far off, that it strains the eyeball in a way that can create pressure inside the eye, which can actually, some people think, elongate the eyeball so that the focal point, right, now comes before the back of the retina, causing, um, causing myopathy, right, nearsightedness. Turns out that if you look at Inuit people, the older generation have very, very low levels of nearsightedness, less than 3%. Children, about like it is in the rest of the world for us, right? 30, 40, 50%, okay? Big difference. Mismatch, okay? Comfortable chairs, I don't know. Historically, people sit like that, right? Now we sit like this. Some people have argued that there's a weakening in, the, in your back muscles that come from sitting in cushy chairs like this all the time, right? And that that can create right, back problems. So fundamental mismatch. And I could go on and on with all sorts of things. All right, here's a remedy. These standing desks are starting to pop up all over at BYU. It's kind of funny. And then this is one I just will end with today. I think it's really fun. Parasites. We just don't have enough parasites in our lives anymore, okay? So it turns out that there are several arguments that suggest that autoimmune disease or um, allergies might be related to the fact that we've removed so many of our natural pathogens from our environment that we don't have these organisms that we were co-evolved to, uh, to deal with. So our immune systems are built to deal with pathogens that are no longer there. So what do our immune systems do? Right? They become very sensitized to other things. Okay? The sort of old friend hypothesis. There are, in fact, some individuals who treat autoimmune disease or who treat allergies by reintroducing pathogens into themselves intentionally, right? So putting uh, parasites back into their bodies with the hope that it will restore a more natural immune response. All right. Well, what do we do? I guess I'm not telling you that you should go out and squat outside or come into the aisles and squat to listen to the talk today, okay? I'm not telling you that... Uh, that that the many advances that we've made in sort of um, cleaning up our environment aren't good things. But we can, in fact, try and find a way 
to restore some of the environmental pressures that would, that would alleviate some of these concerns for us, right? And so if you want to go into medicine, right, you might focus more on prevention and see what we can do to manipulate the environment to avoid mismatches. I'll end by just telling you Darwin, Darwin isn't like the old dude that just tells us about things in the past. But in fact, as we move towards incorporating evolutionary ideas into our lives today, there are many, many things that we could in fact make better. Okay? So I see Darwin as sort of this, uh, this forgotten individual in terms of his science that may in fact have some of the most profound changes in terms of our own human health conditions. And I want to just end on this last pitch. Um, Celia mentioned that I'm like many of you. I, I grew up around here. Um, I, I want to just tell you how much I love Snow College and what's going on here, right? And uh, invite you to think about the great things that you'll do as you move forward in your own academic pursuits. Uh, just, just keep in mind that the world's out there and available for you. It was for me. I'm grateful to so many of the people at Snow College that are, that are still around who made such a big impact on me and, and my career trajectory. And you guys are in just one of the greatest places ever uh, to be studying. So I'll, I'll end with that. I want to wish Charles a happy birthday. I want to thank Charles for what he's done for the way that we view the natural world, right? And especially excited about how his ideas might influence our lives and the quality of life that we have. Thank you. So if you need to scoot to class, scoot to class. But if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to field a question. Or